like to reintroduce today's presentation and today's presenter, Dr. Jeff Bodycomb, who's a product manager for Hariba Particle in the Americas, will be giving a short presentation, probably of 30 minutes in duration, on how to use dynamic light scattering to measure the size of nanoparticles. Yes, so without further ado, please take it away, Jeff. Okay, thank you, Ian. Well, as he said, my name is Jeff. I'm with Hariba Scientific. You could find us on the web at hariba.com slash us slash particle. And I'm going to talk today about nanoparticle analysis and a particular topic of size determination by dynamic light scattering. So I should start by telling you what is dynamic light scattering. And it refers to the measurement and interpretation of light scattering data on a microsecond time scale. So you imagine an experiment where you're measuring scattered light and you can look at it on a longer time scale and look at the average signal, or you can look at the tiny fluctuations in the signal on a very short time. And it's the latter case that we're interested in here. Dynamic light scattering is a rich field and it can be used in a variety of ways. Uh, the most common are to find particle and molecular size. You can really reach down to quite small sizes corresponding to uh, the size of large molecules, right? um, in addition to quite small particles. Learn a little bit about size distribution. There is a more arcane topic where you can use dynamic light scattering to probe the behavior of complex fluids. Here I'm talking about concentrated solutions and suspensions or gels. Um, there are very few people who get interested in this, but it's a neat topic nevertheless. Today I will talk about finding particle and molecular size primarily. Now there are other light scattering techniques. Uh, the first is uh, the two I want to mention are static light scattering. This is where we make measurements over a duration of about one second. And here we can use it for finding particle size for diameters greater than, greater than about 10 nanometers. And you're thinking about laser diffraction instruments such as the LA950 from Hariba. With a somewhat different configuration, you can find polymer molecular weight and second real coefficient and radius of gyration. And these measurements um, are things like Zim plots and are done with somewhat different instrumentation. Uh, the SZ100, which I'll mention later on, does do some of these measurements, but that's really beyond the scope of what we're talking about today, as is electrophoretic light scattering. Now, in electrophoretic light scattering, we're going to apply an electric field and use light scattering to probe the motion of the particles due to the applied field to find electrophoretic mobility and zeta potential. Excuse me. So let's get some perspective. Here I'm going to show particle diameter in microns. I use beard seconds only when I'm fooling around. And you can think of a one millimeter particle as being fairly coarse, so between 10 microns and 1 millimeter, you think of your coarse powders, things you pick up sand at the beach, for example, would fall into this regime. As you move down below 10 microns to 1 micron, you're thinking of fine powders. I started to talk about things like suspensions and slurries. The surface area is getting quite high, and so to keep the particles distinct, you'll wind up using some liquid to keep them separated. As you go below the one micron limit, you're moving into the colloidal and nanometric size regimes. So we've gone from powders as I move down, the suspensions and slurries goes down to 10 nanometers. <clears throat> and, um, and then below that, you're looking at macromolecules such as proteins or polymers in solution. Now you can evaluate these different sizes with a range of techniques. The electron microscope really starts at about a few tens of microns and goes on down to the nanometer range. Acoustic spectroscopy uh, for can cover quite a wide range of sizes. Light up 
obscuration hits the higher end of the size range, and laser diffraction, which is probably the most popular technique for particle sizing, hits the sizes of a lot of industrially important materials, all the way from several millimeters down to about 10 nanometers. Electrozone sensing, very fairly similar to light obscuration, it's a particle counting technique. Dynamic light scattering, which is the topic of today, goes from several microns down to less than a nanometer. Discentrifuges is a fractionation technique. Doesn't reach quite as far down as dynamic light scattering or quite as far up as laser diffraction. And then microscopy and image analysis in the PSA 300, which can measure particles in sizes from several millimeters down to a little below a micron. Now, when we use dynamic light scattering, we're not going to be looking at the particle directly the way, say, an electron micro microscope does. Rather, we're going to be probing a particle motion. Now, particles in suspension undergo Brownian motion due to solvent molecule bombardment um, you know, and random throw motion. So you have water molecules, and they're kicking the big, uh, the larger particles, and so they tend to move around. Brownian motion is random. It's related to the particle size. It's related to viscosity and related to temperature. Well, we can generally know viscosity and we can know temperature. And we're going to interpret the data in terms of a statistical technique. So that uh, the fact it's random will be important in how we think about the data. And then the relationship to size will pop out, so we'll know how large is the particle. There's the nifty cartoon of small particles moving more rapidly than large particles. Now, I've said light scattering about 14 times. I haven't actually mentioned what I mean. So let's talk about the optical arrangement, and I'll give you a sense of what we're measuring. So this is a top view of an optical plate on, say, the SNC-100 or any other dynamic light scattering instrument. You have a, a light source, a laser. It's going to shine a beam of focused light onto the particle sample here. And then we're going to look at it from the side or from the back or from the front with, um, with detectors. So we're going to look at the signal as the intensity of light, say, going off in a 90 degree angle. This extra path shown here is used when one is making a zeta potential measurement or finding electrophoretic mobility. And we'll, um, the next talk in a series of the talk after that, I will be talking about zeta potential. And so we can go into detail there. So I have this signal coming into the detector. And what does it look like? Well, it's random particle motion, and so the scattering from each particle will interfere constructively and destructively with the scattering from other particles. While the particles are moving randomly with respect to each other, so the interference is going to be random. So you signal, see a signal that basically looks like noise because that's kind of what it is. They're random fluctuations, and it's not noise in your detector. It's actually noise from variations in your system. So if we can characterize this noise, then we can start to get at why, at, get at how the particles move, and use that to get at, how, at the size of the particles. Well, it turns out the appropriate way to look at this random noise is to use something called a correlation function. So these random fluctuations are interpreted in terms of an autocorrelation function, which is described really by this integral over here on the right. Basically, I look at the intensity of some reference time, look at the intensity of some delay time, tau, and compare them. And if they're quite, I'm gonna, well, this angle is going to multiply them and sum them up, but I'm going to compare the two. If after a certain delay time, the intensity is still quite similar, it's a high value for the autocorrelation function. Then if I go and wait a long time, a long delay time, the intensity I measure at some late time, is going to be 
relatively unrelated to the intensity at my starting time. And so the correlation is going to be low. So this is an unnormalized all correlation function. Um, and you can see at short times the signals are quite related because the molecules or the particles have not had much time to move with respect to each other. And over a longer time, they have had lots of time to move with respect to each other. And so the autocorrelation function at long delay time is simply related to the overall average scattered intensity. This is an exponential decay and has decay constant gamma. And that's going to be very important to us because that's how I'm going to get my particle size. So I've just shown you how to get gamma from the decay of the autocorrelation function. Q is a scattering vector, which is a function of the wavelength, I'm sorry, of the wavelength of the laser, refractive index of the solvent, scattering angle, or half scattering angle. So I know scattering angle. I'm going to know refractive index because we'll know what the solvent is and we can go measure it or look it up. I prefer to look things up. And I know my laser wavelength. I've just measured gamma, so I get the mutual diffusion coefficient. And then I feed the mutual diffusion coefficient into the stokes einstein relationship, which is Boltzmann constant times temperature. So you can think of that as an energy term. Divide by 3 times pi viscosity, which is a stiff function of temperature, times uh, diffusion. So this is a viscous drag term. Uh, and so I, out of that, I get hydrodynamic diameter. Now, this equation only works for freely diffusing particles. And this is going to inform us in when we go to make a measurement. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's, you can do a lot of stuff with dynamic light scattering from concentrated solutions. Unfortunately, one thing you can't do is say that your particles are freely diffusing. So that's going to set uh, some limits in how we set up measurements. And all this works best in the limit of zero concentration. Although in practice, you don't have to get very close to zero concentration at all. Note the effect of temperature. Temperature shows up here, and the viscosity term is also a function of temperature. What this means is that your measurement results are going to depend on the measurement, on the temperature of your suspension. And so you want to ensure that your suspension has reached the temperature you think it is, it is at before making a measurement. And what that means in practice is when you're going to make a measurement, you put it in the instrument, you wait a few minutes to give it some time to reach thermal equilibrium. Now, what is hydrodynamic size? Well, dynamic light scattering gives you a diameter of a sphere that moves or diffuses the same way as your sample. So if you go and hand me a sample that's a effectively a billiard ball, then it's going to diffuse just like it's going to diffuse like a sphere, and the answer I get is going to be the same number as you get by other analytical techniques. But more often what we find is that not all samples are billiard balls. Classic example, or a very common example, is going to be a particle with some sort of uh, hairy surface. You know, and this can be brought about by surfactants that are stabilizing the particle uh, or some other feature in, the, in how the particle is made. And the hydrodynamic size is not going to be the size of just the green particle, but it's also going to include this extra layer on top. So if the surface is decorated, you can measure the amount of decoration. A second case is if your, if your particles are flocculated or aggregated and they're moving around, and in this case there are five particles that are kind of stuck together. By dynamic light scattering, you can get the size of a sphere that diffuses like this group of particles. And finally, if you have a particle that is not spherical, so here I've uh, drawn an ellipsoid, I still am getting a single number. I'm not going to get either the length or the width, which is a bit inconvenient. But if you know this up front and adjust um, your 
your interpretation of data accordingly, dynamic light scattering can still give you useful information. Now, for hydrodynamic size, the instrument reports the size of the sphere that moves with diffuse electric particle, and that includes stabilizers. And I like this gold collar example uh, because it really shows this case clearly. Um, the data was collected at a bunch of different laboratories and at NIST, and so you can really feel comfortable about the numbers. By atomic force microscopy, they're saying these gold particles are about eight and a half nanometers. About ten nanometers by scanning electron microscopy and about 9 nanometers by transmission electron microscopy. And these differences in numbers comes due to slight differences in how each microscope looks at the edge of the gold particle. We go to dynamic light scattering. We got a size of 13 and a half nanometers. Well, is the DLS measurement wrong? Is the TEM wrong? Well, neither. They're, they're both actually very accurate measurements. Um, the difference is that there's citrate molecules. Let's see if I can make a little pen here and draw. These stabilizers added to the surface of the gold nanoparticle. So the microscope, which looks like, which really uses electron density for contrast, is going to see this particle. But by light scattering, by dynamic light scattering, where we look at the hydrodynamic units, whoops, we're going to see this significantly larger particle. Um, and that's because the stabilizer is a significant fraction of the particle size. And if you try and figure the length of the citrates and reconcile to this difference, you'll find out that the, the numbers match reasonably well. This is a measurement with the uh, SZ100, the polystyrene latex sample, where I plot, um, okay, uh, in a moment I'll talk to you about how we get this frequency as a function diameter plot. What I want you to focus on here is the so-called Z average size, which comes out of the calculation I showed earlier, uh, and the width of size distribution, which is the polydispersity. And so, the, uh, this is supposed to be 103 nanometers. I got 105 nanometers with a quite low value for polydispersed index because, well, it's a monodispersed standard sample. So as an example of polystyrene latex. Now, we use polystyrene latexes a lot because they're, as standards, they're fairly easy to obtain and they're fairly easy to handle. Well, there's another reason that polystyrene latex comes up a lot, and that's because the latex business has been very important for particle sizing for a very long time. And a lot of particle sizing work, particularly in dynamic light scattering, has been driven by the needs of that industry. Aha, the slides were out of order. Okay. Before I mentioned a single decay constant as a gamma. But I can recast the autocorrelation function and say, look, not all my particles are the same size. And so I'm going to have an exponential, and inside that I'm going to have a Taylor series in a decay constant. So I have gamma bar, um, mu2, and so on higher terms. So I'm going to truncate the series here or at the third order term, extract out gamma bar and mu2. From gamma bar I get a mutual diffusion coefficient. So this is an average, and I get the so-called z-average size. Well, uh, this is a very robust calculation, and it's one I recommend for almost all routine work. Actually, for all routine work. Uh, it's because the result is fairly insensitive to noise. One thing you should be aware of is this average is weighted by scattered intensity. And the second is that this average size is not the intensity weighted size uh, or, or the average size. It's really 
the intensity weighted harmonic mean, because we're really, when you start going through the math, you find that you're summing up the reciprocals of intensity and taking the reciprocal, reciprocal of that sum. The polydispersity value is simply the second, second order term divided by the square of the first order term, and that gives you a sense of the width of the size distribution. So let's look at another very common material, silica. I have measured the sample four times, and it's a uh, almost 500 nanometer particle. You can see the z average diameters do not vary by very, do not vary by much at all, and all overall average of 480. And the polydispersity index, that second order uh, term, varies somewhat more. And again, the average is fairly low, 0 0.08. So this term we have the most confidence in. This tends to vary a little bit more, but tells you more about the width of your size distribution. Jeff, can I interrupt you for a second? Sure. Daniel asks a question, and uh, I have to apologize. He asked it maybe two or three minutes ago. Does okay. the uh, does dynamic light scattering technology detect fluid boundary layers? Well, it, it does, but yes, it does. So, um, I, I what's you're going to have scattering from any any place with a difference in refractive index. So if you have two fluids and they each have different refractive indices, which they generally do, you're going to, you're going to see a scattering signal. Uh, so there, there are two things I can imagine Daniel's asking about. I'll probably think of three more as I talk. Uh, the first is that you have some sort of emulsion, like an oil and water emulsion, in which case dynamic light scattering does a great job of measuring the size of the oil droplets in the emulsion or vice versa. Dynamic light scattering will work with almost any solvent. Um, the second is if there's some sort, if there's a um, mixture of two fluids, say you take uh, oil and water and you shake them up and then it starts to phase separate again, like your salad dressing, and now we have two macroscopic phases separating and that's going to scatter so much it will just blind it will overwhelm the detectors and you won't get anything out, except you'll know something's happening. Um, and the third would be some sort of uh, drop phase separation. And if, if that happens by a nucleation and growth phenomenon, we might be able to track that by dynamic light scattering. So uh, do, does that cover any of Daniel's cases? I don't see anything in the chat box yet. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, here, let's, uh, let's try this. So he asked a follow-up question. Let me see if he has a microphone, and we'll just put him on, and that'll be maybe a little bit faster. What he's saying is that he also means that there's a layer of fluid around a particle that is stationary and sort of connected to the particle and moves with it, i.e., zero velocity. Aha. Great question. And he does not have a microphone. Okay. Still Might it make great. it seem slightly larger? That's right. In fact, that would be very similar. I just zip back. That would be very similar to this case here. So you can imagine the particle, and instead of having uh, some, some polymers decorating the surface or some surfactants, we could just have, let's find a pen here, some water molecules that travel with the particle. And so th this blue line is down the shear plane, and we're really going to measure everything that travels with the particle. And you may think, well, water molecules are awfully small and unimportant, but uh, these, the particles we're looking at are so small that the water molecule size can become significant, particularly if the layers start to build up. Yeah, so that certainly is an issue. Good question, Daniel. Thank you. Yeah. I have to add that to my presentation. Okay, we did this. We're talking about SiO2. 
right. Now, of course, after preparing a sample and making a measurement, you want to beat as much information out of the measurement as possible. So you'll start to say, well, wait a minute, if I have uh, particles of different sizes, each moving with different relaxation times, then my measured signal is just the sum of those of the signals from each individual particle. And it actually works out to be true. Uh, I'm going to recast the other correlation function in uh, terms of what's called the electric field auto correlation function. And don't, don't worry about that or call me later if you want to discuss that. Uh, it puts Ian to sleep. So you have, what you do is you measure C, and it's fairly quick to get to G. That's all you need to know. And G is just an integral of all the relaxation times, times exponential, uh, with the decay constants. Okay, so if I knew S, let's get a pen here. So now I have G, and I just need to solve for S a gamma. And that looks fairly straightforward, except this is what's known as an ill-posed problem, which means us experimentalists go off and add assumptions until the whole thing works, even though the mathematicians are running away in horror, because the results are often quite sensitive to noise. But you can play this game with many samples uh, and recognize that you're adding information when you do this kind of analysis. And so you may as well finish by adding what you, the experimentalist, know about your system. So if you see 47 peaks and you expect a continuous distribution, you can probably guess that there's a noise problem. Let's take some 20 nanometer latex and I apply this analysis to get a peak at about 20 nanometers and a 500 nanometer latex. So this is two discrete samples and measure first the 20 nanometer, take that out of the instrument, put in the 500 nanometer. I get my peak at two, three, four, 500 nanometers, so I'm quite happy. And I mix the two, and I mix the two so they both scatter about the same amount of light. And so that's the black lines here. And the green and the blue are the individual samples. And so you can actually resolve out the two peaks of the 20 and the 500. So uh, this is an easy case. Uh, obviously, I'm not testing the resolution limit of the instrument with, with these kinds of measures, with, with this particular case of samples. But it illustrates how the technique can be made to work. Um, generally, your peaks have to be spaced fairly far apart. Generally, your intensities from each have to be within the same order of magnitude. And this is not the kind of analysis you want to assign to your third shift quality control guys, because uh, you want them to be able to make effective decisions without having to worry too much about a bunch of other analytical work. But if you're doing formulation work and you understand your system, this can teach you a whole lot. Uh, so if you're preparing liposomal formulations, and you're making measurements, and you start seeing two peaks consistently, and you kind of suspected that might happen even though you didn't want it to, then this would be very valuable information for you to guide you towards a recipe or, or manufacturing scheme that would suppress the second peak. So this is a valuable analysis. Generally, it belongs more in the R&D lab than the quality control environment. Okay, some practical tips. Dust. Dust is a big thing for light scattering guys. These are large, rare particles in the sample. When they're large, they scatter quite strongly, and so that makes them a problem. If they were common in the sample, that's part of your sample, and so you want to see them. If they're rare, you'd really rather not. So you can think of things like dust falling in from the ceiling. Uh, they're not really part of the sample. Since they're rare, you can't get good statistics. Uh, you need a certain number of particles of each size in your measurement in order to get, in order to make dynamic light scattering work. So how do you get rid of dust? Well, you want to keep everything very clean 
and then you want to clean up your suspensions. You want to filter. It, um, if your particles are uh, too large to filter the entire suspension, say the diameter is greater than about 50 nanometers for using a 100 nanometer filter, at least filter the diluent. So you might have your particle concentrate, and when you add it to a diluent, you'll add it to a filter diluent in order to keep the number of particles down. You can buy filters in sizes from 20 nanometers to 2 microns. You can also centrifuge a sample and extract the supernatant. A second comment is settling. Now, dynamic light scattering works up to reasonably large size particles, many microns. But gravity is present for most of us. And we're looking at particle motion. So here I have a table of particle diameters, movement due to the Brownian motion, and motion due to gravitational set settling on roughly the same scale. So if I take a 10 nanometer particle, Brownian motion is much stronger than gravitational settling. Even at 500 nanometers, gravitational settling is not an issue. As I move over a micron for particle size, then gravitational settling can be a problem. A couple things. One is particles are moving in a way we don't plan on them moving while we make the measurement. And second is they tend to wind up, the, wind up at the bottom of your cuvette, and so you don't measure them because they're no longer in the measurement area. So that's really the natural limit for dynamic light scattering. Now there are tricks to extend the technique up into larger particle sizes. Often they're not very practical. So why would you use dynamic light scattering? It's non-invasive. Uh, you make a measurement on a sample, you take it out, and you can use it for your application, or you can analyze it using a different analytical technique. It requires only small quantities of, of uh, sample, and sorry for that. It requires only small quantities of sample, as little as 10 microliters, and it's good for detecting trace amounts of aggregate. Finally, it's a good technique for macromolecular sizing. So if you want to characterize proteins, their conjugates and aggregates, dynamic light scattering is quite useful. Now, Hariba has just come out with a new nanoparticle analyzer, the SZ100. It's a single compact unit that does uh, dynamic light scattering for size, electrophoretic light scattering for zeta potential, and static light scattering for molecular weight measurements. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about each of these techniques in turn over the coming months, and we'll have other people talk about the techniques and their applications. So I think this is a good time for questions and answers. So if you have any more questions, please type them in the chat box. Or if they occur to you 20 minutes later, you can email them at labinfo at hariba.com. Or you can email me at jeff.bodycomb at hariba.com. OK, thanks very much, Jeff. And as he was saying, now is the time to send in any questions. Edward's asking if we're going to demonstrate the unit at the next ACS show. And I'm assuming, Edward, you're talking about the one in Denver at, uh, I think it's the end of August or early September, something like that? For the record, Ian, I did not pay Edward to ask that question. <laughs> yes, we will be at the next ACS show. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll have the SU100 there as well, right? Yes, yes. I'll, actually, I'll be there. And um, yeah, we'll have, an, we'll have an instrument there. We will not be running samples. Uh, more generally, we, yeah. yeah. I don't remember our booth number offhand. Ian, do you know our booth number? I can look it up in just a few seconds. Okay. 
Jeff and uh, another scientist at Hariba Scientific named Una Lee will have a, uh, a short presentation as well. Yeah, yeah, that, yes, we'll be giving a talk on image analysis. So that's almost looking the other end of the size scale. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> Bear with me a second. We're at booth 1612. I'll go ahead and type that into the chat box. And Jeff's an avid skier, and I know that it's going to be summer, but uh, Edward, should you attend and you don't find Jeff in the booth, please contact me. My email address <laughs> is in the booth. I need to make sure that uh, that he's not on the slopes or I don't know. All right, so we have a few other questions. Let's move on. Let's see. I Forgive me if I mispronounce your first name, but I believe it's Kamendra is asking, how can we interpret anisotropic particles or anisotropic? Okay. If you have a, if you have a, a particle that's, that is anisotropic, so that's something like the ellipsoid that I showed earlier, when you perform a dynamic light scattering measurement, you're going to get the size of a sphere that diffuses in the same way as your particle. Now, there are relations between uh, the dimensions of an ellipsoid and a sphere that diffuses the same way, but for more complex shapes, I don't think there are any easy relationships. Uh, you know, so in, um, you know, so if you're thinking about carbon nanotubes, you might use dynamic light scattering as a way to screen your samples to find uh, the largest nanotube or smallest, whatever your target is, and then go back and look at it by other techniques to find out more details about their dimensions. It, so it, you really only get one number out of dynamic light scattering or one dimensional measure of your particle. All right. Linda is asking for uh, what's involved with sample preparation, and that's kind of a broad question, so maybe just hit the highlights. Okay. Well, I mentioned, I mentioned filtering. Uh, that's one highlight. The second is that you want to keep in mind the fact that you want freely diffusing particles. So uh, when you prepare your suspensions, you, of course, want to ensure that your particles are not all sticking together because these things have immense surface area. They'd rather stick together than not. And so you're going to start thinking about the use, using surfactants in order to keep them apart. And then you're going to start thinking about using some background elec some electrolyte or salt to knock down long-range electrostatic interactions. So you take polystyrene and latex. Well, those are generally charged in water. And so you make the measurement in uh, 10 millimolar salt just to su suppress the effect of these ionic interactions so you get the size of the particles as they, as they diffuse rather than start measuring electrostatic interactions between particles. Yeah, and uh, in case two, well, I guess Linda's asking a follow-up question. So very dilute samples, is it similar to zeta potential by electrophoresis? For sample preparation, yes, the, um, it's very similar to zeta potential by electrophoresis. Generally, you have to go to somewhat lower concentrations. Um, and then... The second is that in the zeta potential measurement, you're quite in, you're interested in looking at the electrostatic behavior of your particle, and in dynamic light scattering for size, you're interested in suppressing that electrostatic behavior. So, and and that latter point is probably the biggest difference between the two. Yeah, and I'll make a, a quick point that you should also be concerned about the dispersion conditions, right? As the particles get smaller and smaller, the dispersion matters more and more. We just ran into this in our own lab. I mean, we run into it very, very often, but specifically, I'll uh, refer to a sample submission that came in late last week, and we did some analyses on it yesterday, and it turned out that if all we did was disperse it in sort of 10 millimolar KCL, there, uh, the emulsion started to break. So we had to take, you know, more than just a one-size-fits-all approach, obviously, to dispersing that material. So it matters more and more. You know, if you're a laser diffraction user, however much care and consideration you give to dispersion conditions, you have to care about it a little bit more when you're talking about dynamic light scattering. 
as a general rule of thumb. Hector is asking that for biomolecules, what is the typical range for a size measurement? The the typical range of sizes goes you know, from a few nanometers, which is really limited by the biomolecules that are, well, limited by bio biomolecules, the smallest ones come in around three or four, uh, up to many, many nanometers as you start thinking, you know, tens or hundreds for an aggregate, uh, as you think of ag aggregated bi biomolecules. Uh, the second way you could think about it is the concentration, and generally, we like to see concentrations for that kind of material in the milligrams per mL. Now we don't need very much material. Uh, we need so we can take uh, use a 10 microliter sample cell or a 50 microliter sample cell, and then at 10 megs per mL, you're thinking about 10 micrograms of material. So you don't need much. And now there's an upper limit which is when the when those molecules start to collide with each other. I'm not sure where that limit is. Um, I used to have a table. I'll have to draw it up again someday. Uh, but at several hundred megs per mL, that's going to be too concentrated to get a clean size measurement out. Of course, if you can prepare a, a bio-macromolecule solution at that high concentration, you probably have a good career ahead of you in the drug industry. <laughs> That's apparently quite a challenge. All right, Daniel's asking, if fluid viscosity is very high, how does that affect the upper limit of particle resolution? Well, it, if viscosity, well, um, if viscosity is high, then all your motion is going to be slower. Um, and so that's going to, that, so you have two competing effects. One is, if you slow the system down enough, you won't have enough measurable motion. Uh, so if you think about, well, let's you know, take water viscosity and drive it over to ice, and the viscosity is somewhere close to infinity, nothing moves, we can learn nothing. But the advantage of going to higher viscosity, of course, is that gravitational effects are much weaker. So in general, for what I'll call reasonable viscosities, uh, tends to move the upper limit higher because it suppresses the effect of gravity. And I'm sure if we look, we can find a counterexample, but just as a rule of thumb. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that looks like it's the, uh, well, just as I was going to say, that was the last question. We get one at the very last second. Commendra is asking, can we get some dynamics of domain boundaries in gel samples? Dynamics of boundaries in gel samples. <sighs> the Toyuchi Tanaka used to do uh, flexing of gels, so you could get it at things like the gel modulus um, in a gel sample. But if you have, so if you have a grain, you, so you, you said grain boundaries in gel samples, Ian. She's saying yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Ah. Uh, if the grains, uh, it depends on the size of the grains. I think the grains would have to be uh, somewhere on the order. The size of the grains has to be somewhere on the order of the uh, wavelength of light. I think. So I'm thinking if you grow, so as these boundaries move, that's kind of like crazy. If your length scale and time scale is in the right neighborhood, you should see something. One to five microns, Commander is saying. One to five microns? You know, you're better, at that size, you're better off looking at it with a, an optical microscope. Although I guess your grain boundary, you want to look at very, very small motions. Well, I can, I can almost see the smoke coming out of Jeff's ears. And <laughs> I'm, I'm in California and he's in New Jersey, so I'll make the recommendation that uh, Commander... Yeah, my email's there. <laughs> 
Yeah, you, you too should continue this through email and maybe through a phone call. Um, otherwise, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today and asking very good questions. As we've been saying uh, ad nauseum, feel free to contact us. I think we provided three different email addresses. You'll have mine, you have Jeff's on the screen, and you can always contact us at labinfo at hariba.com. I think five to six people monitor that email address, so it's a very efficient way of uh, throwing a very wide net in for asking questions. I should say, too, that probably within two to three business days at the most, you'll see this webinar video archived on our website in the Download Center. Go ahead and go to hariba.com slash us slash particle. Go to the Download Center in the webinars area, and you'll see it there. It'll be coded as TE012 for the 12th technology-based webinar we've given. Other than that, thank you again for attending, and I hope you have a very enjoyable remainder of the day.